Hello, beautiful people. This is Samson Williams, uh, here president of the Crowdfunding Professional Association. So I'm really excited to have with us Professor George Pullen. Uh, he's a space economist. And of course, you're probably wondering, uh, Samson, what does space have to do with crowdfunding? George is smiling. Uh, oh, so before I forget it, we are going to talk to George about SPACs. And so we've seen this. Of course, it's like, what's the relationship between SPACs and crowdfunding? And what, why are we having a space economist talk about SPACs and crowdfunding? But first, I'm going to remind George. George, please give us your um, disclaimer. Oh, sure. So I'm happy to be here talking to the Crowdfunding Association. Um, I think it's a wonderful organization. I'm happy to help. I'm helping, of course, in my personal capacity, not in my professional capacity. Um, I do have a day job, and my day job is I'm currently the acting assistant director of the Division of Market Oversight for the CFTC, which is a government entity. Um, most of the time, I'm a senior economist, but because we're in those first 100 days or just a little bit after, I'm now an acting assistant director. Uh, the point is that when I'm speaking to you today, again, it's in my personal capacity, so anything I say today doesn't represent the views, thoughts, or feelings of um, an actual director. I don't, I don't currently have one, but if I did, um, the commissioners, the chairman, or anyone else in the U.S. government. So this is George um, in my academic and personal capacity talking to you. Awesome, awesome. So thank you. So throwing away your CFTC hat for just a hot moment. Um, talk to us about SPAC special purpose acquisition companies. What are they? Why have they been such a rage? Sure. So the first thing that people should know is that SPACs or special purpose acquisition companies are not new. Uh, they've actually been around since the 90s. What's new is that they've just garnered a lot more of attention lately because there's been so many of them. Um, since they became legal under SEC rules back in the 90s, there's actually been over 500 SPACs. Um, and a lot of times they're referred to as blank check companies. Now, if you think of them as blank check companies, by the way, they don't like being called that, so don't call it to their face. But if you, <laughs> but if you think of them as blank check companies, they don't have operating... Um, they, don't, they don't have operations, right? Their only purpose is to raise money and then to an acquire another company which has operations, you know, goods, products, services, all those things we like. And this is an alternative for companies to a traditional IPO. Mm -hmm. And so uh, because we're the Crowdfunding Professional Association and these facts are alternatives to IPO, is, how is this going to impact the crowdfunding realm and can retail investors invest in SPACs? Two good questions. Um, the first is, I'll go with the second one first. The first is that retail investors can invest in SPACs. So a SPAC goes through its own IPO. And when the SPAC goes through its own IPO, anyone could participate in it and go to the New York Stock Exchange or whatever your favorite exchange or platform is and purchase a SPAC. The SPAC only exists until it is merged with, it acquires the other business that has the operations, okay? So retail investors can participate in SPACs. Um, the second part of why this is important to the, oh, the police are coming. Someone didn't file their paperwork, right? Um, <laughs> they will come. Um, the, the, the second thing about why it's important to uh, crowdfunding professionals is it's important to understand the, the larger ecosystem that crowdfunding fits into. So that includes Reg A+, Reg D, IPOs, and of course, SPACs. If, if we have a good idea of how all of these work together, it helps us think about exits. And if you wanna demonstrate your expertise as a crowd funder, you can't spell expertise without an exit. I just made that up, but I think it's a good one. Um, and you can check out my spelling, but I'm pretty sure that works. Um, but, and what I mean by that is, for liquidity purposes, the people who invest in crowdfunding campaigns, right, that your investors, your fans, they, they want to have an eventual exit. Um, one of the ways that someone who participates in early crowdfunding for a business might experience an exit, or perhaps yours is more of a lifestyle brand and you're going to be paying them a dividend. That's also completely fine. Um, but if your goal is for an exit, they might experience that when you go through a Reg A or when you go through a traditional IPO. The other option is that this company could eventually end up being purchased by a SPAC. Now, SPACs right now, on average, are around 385 million. That's probably a little bit higher valuation than most of the companies that uh, you're targeting. But 
keep in mind that the mode or the most occurring number is closer to 100 million. So once a company has been brought to a valuation of 100 million, a SPAC is a legitimate exit tool for early investors. So in my head, I'm seeing the opportunity being uh, family, friends and family, reg CF round. You might do a reg eight, I'm sorry, a uh, uh, seed round in a reg CF capacity again, because you're probably raising two and a half, three million dollars in your seed round. Later, when you move up to the reg A plus field, where you're raising up to $75 million per, per annum, then maybe if you hit that point in where a SPAC would make sense for someone might, where you might go public via a SPAC. And so I want to put a pause for a moment because you are the space economist. So of course, it's like, why are we talking to a space economist? What is the space economy? And I'm going to cheat because I'm looking at some notes here. Momentous, AST, Astra, Black Sky, Spire, and Rocket Labs. Those are all SPACs specific to the space to space businesses and space industries. Can you give us a little bit of understanding of what is the space economy? What's the space industry? And why are there so many SPACs in space? So the reason, first of all, that there's so many SPACs in space is because not unlike the conversation we just had about what does an exit look like for an early investor, um, where dividend and lifestyle brand is in the play, for space, there hasn't been a shortage of space investments. So the space economy, think about it as a ecosystem that exists about 100 kilometers overhead. That's where the Carmen line is. Um, the ISS is only 250 some odd miles away. So no more than from my place in DC here to New York. Um, and it already has about 400 billion with a B dollars of economic activity. It is forecast by many to be adding another billion dollars this decade and then approaching three to four billion soon after. Um, other economists look at the cis lunar, which is the area between the earth and the moon, um, not to use too many space terms, but the cis lunar economic zone being worth $10 trillion per year by 2050. So the amount of entrepreneurs that will be aiming for these stars Ha, ha, ha. Um, the, the, the number of entrepreneurs that will be, you know, aiming for the stars and looking to moon is going to be bigger and bigger. And the number of existing businesses, which will develop operations and verticals that specifically look to capture a piece of space economic activity is also projected to increase. So there are so many SPACs in space because companies that got their start back in 2010, 2013, which is really when Space Race 2.0 took off, um, are now seven or eight years later. And in most traditional models, seven to eight years later is when your classic family offices, funds, and PE firms, VCs, are looking to get out, right? And how are they getting out? Well, they're getting out with facts. Excellent, excellent. Good to know. And so as we wrap this up, George, I really want to thank you for taking out the time to do from your busy regular day job to come hang out with us today. But I want to give a shameless plug. I want to say it's to Blue Shift, their main company, I want to say. I know that um, they might have just ended their Reg CF campaign. Um, and so I'll let you tell us a little bit about Blue Shift. If I'm putting you on the spot, whatever you can tell us about Blue Shift, because they are conducting a Reg CF campaign. Sure. So um, Blue Shift is a great example of a space company that's currently doing a Reg CF campaign. Um, Soul Star and Space Fab also did regulatory crowdfunding campaigns. Um, I'm sure there's others, so I'm not trying to pick favorites here. Uh, Blue Shift is based in Maine, my home state. Uh, their regulatory crowdfunding campaign is aimed at helping them get to their uh, next stage rocketry. So they've already had two test rockets that have successfully flown and delivered payloads, which are micro and nano sats, which are the smaller satellites that are about the size of your cell phone into space. They're now looking to build their next generation of rockets, which will deliver larger payloads to space. They're unique because they use a completely biodegradable fuel source. Most people don't know this, but if you've been following ESG, you should, probably should, that rockets tend to let off a lot of stuff um, that we're not a big fan of right now. And so um, it's probably a good idea that the space industry pays attention to alternative fuels. And so Blue Shift is an alternative fuel play in the space vertical. 
Awesome, awesome. So best of luck to Blue Shift and the other entrepreneurs and businesses that are part of the space economy and that are looking to raise funds uh, via crowdfunding for their space businesses. And so here at the Crowdfunding Professional Association, sometimes we talk about a uh, real dope coffee company who's in the middle of their uh, Reg CF they were on earlier for our presentation here at the Crowdfunding Summit. And so now we're talking about space. So between coffee and space, if you're thinking about raising money for your business, so long you fall in between that coffee space and that space space, you should consider uh, regulation crowdfunding. And so I'm very excited about the future of crowdfunding. What were you going to say, George? Well, I was going to mention one more thing. So um, I know this isn't specifically geared toward any one platform, so I won't name any platforms. But if you also look at the space vertical in general, um, the reason that you see crowdfunding platforms targeting that vertical right now is there is a natural transition that exists between government funding from NSF grants, SPIRs, STTRs, um, and the like, which are about just a series of acronyms for when Uncle Sam or NASA passes out grant money. And they get their first 250000 in grant funding. They've probably already gone through family and friends to get to that point. They then are eligible many times for another million dollars or so in follow-on funding, but that doesn't get them to where they need to get to get their space tech out there. And so they're looking to crowdfunding. And I think that's why this conversation is important. And this education is important so that you know that these space folks will be coming to ask you questions. Awesome. That is a very good point to wrap up on. If you've ever completed a grant process for any of the acronyms uh, George just talked about from the government, you're probably 90, 95% of the way to being crowdfunding ready. That last five, 10%, that's where you can work with any of the crowdfunding association professionals to help you get that last 10% out of the way. So George, thanks very much for joining us here for our Crowd Summit. Uh, we hope to see you in person very soon. Until then, uh, be well, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.